and good morning uh, to each one of you. First Sabbath in the new year. How awesome. As we open today, let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, with gratitude we come before you to study your word. We invite you to be in our presence. And may the word be a light unto our path. And may we realize that it's good for our instruction and your presence is in it. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we begin a new quarter series entitled Managing the Mass for the Master Till He Comes. The title would suggest the Master, God, is trusting something to us, his servants, to manage his goods. They also, the title would suggest stewardship, accountability, but not ownership. The word managing suggests looking after what is entrusted to us. In God's eyes, however, management also involves investing, not just managing what's there, but investing to increase the assets. This is illustrated in the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25, where two servants are commended for investing and increasing the assets of the master, while one servant is called a wicked servant for just managing his talent. So I think that the word management in the Bible includes the idea of investing to increase, uh, to expand what is already God's, as well as looking after what you have. The first lesson that we're looking at today is entitled Part of God's Family. And when you think of your heritage, do you ever visualize going from yourself family by family by family all the way back to Adam? That would be, how would you like to meet your great, 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 great? Wouldn't that be awesome? Maybe you have done a heritage check and I did it once and found out um, some heritage. In fact, they had a coat of arms. It had a skull and a couple things on it, and I figured they must have been related to medical field. Do you think it possibly uh, that there is a break someplace in your lineage going back and that there was an ape or a sea creature or something in that? That's quite a thought. No, for those who accept the Bible, we accept that our creation goes right back to Adam. Because the Bible presents a line of history for, straight from us back to Adam and Eve. Let me ask you, are you happy about that? Or would you rather it had been different? Would you... Um, which means then we have something in common with every other human being. Is there any other living creature on earth that you'd rather be than a human being? Every once in a while you may feel that way. Oh, I'd like to just be like a cat or a dog. I could sleep on the pillow and be fed and watered and walked. And oh, I think that'd be kind of boring, don't you think, after a while? <laughs> no. Unless someone has the thought on that, I'll pass on. We all contented that we're humans? Okay. All right, let's move into Sunday's lesson. We are part of God's family. When you think of the Lord's Prayer, it, le it links us with God. Is there any human being that would be excluded and would not be able to say that prayer? Is there any human being on the circle of the earth that would not be able to repeat the Lord's Prayer? Do you think everybody can? If that's true, and that says an awful lot, they may be different statures, they may be different colors, they may have different cultures, but we are all what? We are all brethren. By creation, we're all brethren by creation, even though there's such diversity. I can remember being in university, and Thursday nights 
was our family night, and we'd often go to the pool at Andrews University. And to see all the different families from different cultures around the world enjoying family in that water. And I come primarily from the Maritimes when there was actually never a person of color in our, my community. And I, sat, I remember sitting there and looking and said, isn't this awesome? They love their children just like I love my children. And they're all these different cultures. We have a beautiful, beautiful mosaic of people in the world, and we're basically, our basic needs and our both basic love expressions are the same. And that's a beautiful thing. All right, the first text I'd like you to look up is Ephesians chapter 3, 14 and 15. How does this text link us with others? How does this text link us with others? Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. The text, someone be willing to read that. Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. All right, what does this text, Margaret, tell us about others? Well, that I have more brothers and sisters than I count in my biological family. <laughs> but in my spiritual family, we are all brothers and sisters because we are all part of that whole family that's not only here on earth, but in heaven as well. So I assume that means we are somehow or other related uh, to the angels, yes. because we, they, are, they too are part of God's creation. Yes, they can claim fa the Father as well. Beautiful, good. Uh, and it says, uh, how do I relate to the Father in this verse? Um, it says, I bow my knees. I acknowledge that he is the creative Father. Uh, staying uh, in the book of Ephesians, you go to chapter 1 and verse 10, uh, tells us that Jesus also brings us together in one family. Uh, what does it say in Ephesians 1.10? Ephesians 1.10. That in the distance, distance taken, dispensation, of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in him. Thank you. Now, that, that uh, verse opens up a very interesting dynamic uh, about um, the first text told us that uh, the created beings in heaven and we have something in common. We have uh, one father who is our creator. This verse tells us something very interestingly. It, what does it tell us about the created beings in heaven and the created beings on earth? It, okay, he's coming with the mic. So those that are online can hear. Um, it tells us that mm. uh, beings on, in heaven and on earth will be brought together under God's leadership. Yes that we are brought together, and what was it that brought us together? It says there... His plan, I guess. Um, well, let me just look. It's in dispensation and fullness of time, might gather together and want all things in Christ. So when Christ died on the cross, he brought together heaven and earth, all the created beings. And you say, well, uh, does that mean that the... Uh, the created beings in heaven sinned and that Christ made atonement for them as well? Is that what it's saying? Do you ever visualize that the created things and beings in heaven may have sinned? Is that what it's saying? Uh, no, it will be, everybody will be in one accord in heaven and on earth because sin entered in heaven. So when Christ... Just put the mic a little closer. Mm -hmm. Say it again. We will be all brought together because sin entered in heaven, not on earth first. So sin will be cleansed from heaven and on earth, and we'll all be brought together. 
So what happened to those that uh, rebelled in heaven? Well, they were cast out. They were cast out, right. The ones that sided with the devil were cast out. So how would, how would the death of Christ bring us all together? Because the whole universe knows that Satan, what his plan was from the, the beginning, that he was jealous of Christ and his position. And now we all know that sin and has a terrible ending and Christ, well, God's character is vindicated. Yes. Um, the whole universe man, watched, watched the great controversy played out here on this earth. And when Christ came as a babe, from the time he was a babe to the time he died on the cross, they observed the great controversy being played out. Did the devil try to eliminate Jesus when he was a baby? Yeah, we know that from uh, Matthew 2 when Herod's tried to kill the baby. Uh, do you think the devil was on his track all along? He was on his track all along. Every, every temptation in the book was thrown at Jesus. Plus, and then you remember the temptations in the wilderness, how the devil even said, look, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world if you do what? And can you imagine how angels in heaven, oh, in that moment, they're just paralyzed. No, 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 Jesus, don't yield to that. And he, and he didn't. He said, no, you should worship God alone. So the, when Jesus lived his life and ultimately gave his life as a sacrifice, the universe said, we've seen enough. We honor our, our creator, God. We want nothing to do with that rebellious angel. So in the life of Jesus and his death and resurrection and back to heaven to minister on our behalf, heaven and earth comes together to honor the Father. Does that make sense? Biblical sense? Yeah. Okay. Now, sometimes when you think of family, um, is there anyone here that thinks their pet is part of their family? If you have a pet that you love, it's part of the family, right? Um, so, when you think of family on earth, you often think about your pets as part of the family. Then do you think then uh, the broader creation can include, they can be included in God's family. Can pets be included in God's family in his thinking? It's included in yours. Would you think he'd include pets in, our, in his? Or it's just people? Interesting thought. Uh, he certainly loves his pets. Wouldn't you agree? And it's interesting that he's made some domestic so, so they don't eat us for dinner. We enjoy them. Because there's some pets you could have. Have you ever uh, come across YouTubes? How pets have turned bad? And uh, they have either squeezed their owners to death or had them for lunch. I'm glad that we have a few domesticated that they won't do that. All right, uh, now let's move to the spiritual realm. Galatians chapter 3 talks about the spiritual family, not just the biological family. And it says in verse 26 to 29, For you are all what of God? You are all sons and daughters of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For as many as of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ. If you are Christ and your Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now there are two, two important points there. Number one is, if you are Christ's, what does, make, what does that make you with other people that have made a choice to be Christ? You are brothers and sisters, but it says also you are what of God? You are sons and daughters of God. Um, the second part, it links us to someone in history. Who does it link it to his, in history if you, if you uh, accept Christ? Abraham's. Is that important? Does that have any importance at all? If you're linked to Abraham, okay. Abraham is considered the father of the faithful. God called him 
before he was circumcised. So he's an inclusive uh, symbol for everybody. Uh, he's, uh, he represents um, the father of, of the Old Testament and the father of the New Testament. Yes, uh, and, he's, and, and when he was called in Genesis chapter 12, it says, Abraham, uh, you're going to be a blank to all the families of the earth. What's that blank word? You're going to be a blessing. So you're not just going to be a great nation, you're going to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. So the picture of the Old Testament is that God makes a selection of someone selects them out of all the options, but for the purpose of not their being great for themselves, but for the purpose that they can be a blessing to the world. So it is interesting that here in Galatians it says, if you are Christ, you are Abraham's seed. So that's a spiritual heritage, and you will then be a blessing uh, to uh, to the world. So we have, um, so we have often used the term spiritual Israel, and uh, we find that when you take a look at the uh, uh, the book of Romans, Paul says not everybody who is of Israel, not everyone who is of Israel is of Israel. Uh, you may be a member biologically, but you really do not have that spiritual heritage. And is it possible that we can be a member on the church books and not have Christ in our hearts? Yeah, it's the same idea. So that, that is important. It's, there's a lot of depth here that when you're in the Old Testament, you look at Abraham's lineage, uh, his, his son, grandchildren, Jacob became Israel, became 12 tribes, you have a geographical nation entrusted with the, these teachings of God uh, to be a blessing to the world, and through Israel, God was blessing the world. But when you come to the New Testament, Jesus said that that blessing is taken away from them, and that you now have the New Testament church. Each individual Jewish person can still be part of that church, but it goes through the cross into the church, now it is universal rather than geographical, and it's all the nations of the world make up, makes up his people, uh, and we are to be a blessing to the world. So that's one of the great uh, misteachings today, uh, that everything is still focused on the Middle East, and you have the secret rapture and other things. That is not biblical uh, teaching. All right, Romans 8.14. This is another verse tells us how we become, how we become sons and daughters of God. Romans 8, 14, would someone read that? Romans 8, 14, for as many are as led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So how do you become a son or daughter of God? You must be led by? Spirit of God, and indicates that in, in the same book, same chapter, it says the natural heart is not in harmony with God, neither can be. So that's a good question. Uh, what happened? At creation, you can assume it, God pronounced it very, very good, and if God pronounces creation very good and Adam and Eve very good, that would certainly indicate that the creation would be in harmony with him. So how comes now we have to be led by the Spirit to embark in the family of God. What happened uh, that created that need of being led by the Spirit? What happened? What happened to humankind? It's called sin. Thank you for shouting out. Uh, sin happened, right? That tells you then when Adam and Eve made that choice that something clicked, something broke. Adam and Eve no longer were under the direct direction of God, and another had dominion over them. And in order for them to come back, they needed two things. And Genesis 3.15 is a prophecy about Christ coming and going to put enmity again. 
in the heart of us and bring us back into family, sure. So it's important for us to realize that in order to come back into harmony with God, a recreation, we need to be what they call, you must be born again. We must be led by the Spirit. We must accept Jesus taking care of our death ticket and allow him then to have control in our lives. Okay, let's go into Monday's lesson. Monday's lesson. God is owner of everything. So I have a question here for you. I'll respond to it too. Is there anyone here this morning that lives in the same house that they lived in when they were a child? Really? Look, there are actually two. Two people live in the same house. That's awesome. Um, that is not normal, is it? That is great, but it's not normal. To be able to have that privilege, you have a lot of memories in that house. Uh, some of us go back to the areas where we were born, and we what do we usually do? We drive by those places, right? And we look in, and we said, I could go through each room and can remember the memory stories around that. Um, but to have it for your home and to be as young as you are is beautiful. Uh, and as you drive by, you say, this is my home. It, it hits you when you, you know, we just, when my mom and dad passed away and we were here in Newfoundland in 2012. Uh, we said, do we keep the home and fix it up and go back to it in retirement or, and rent it out and wait all that out? And we said, no, even though the homestead means a lot, uh, we're going to move on and so sold the place. Um, but it has ever hit you that going through life, there's so many things that you possess and then you leave them behind. And you may have a car, you say, oh, I'm going to keep this car for life. How long is life? Four years, five years, some of us maybe eight years. And the day you take it off the lot, where is it hitting for? Yeah, we all know. Things that we buy here are generally a one-way streak to ending up in the junkyard someplace. And so as you go through life, you realize that uh, as you pass through it, uh, most things are not permanent. So we're looking at God as the owner of everything. The first question is, how did Solomon feel about his hard labor and the things he owned in Ecclesiastes 2, 18 and 19? How did Solomon feel about the things that he worked hard for and that he owned? Do you have a Bible with you? Do you have a Bible? Are you able to read? Did you come up? This young lady has a, she'll read it for us. Ecclesiastes 2, 18 and 19. Ecclesiastes 2. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. I hated all things I had told for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish. Yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. Thank you. Um, so Solomon must be a little in his older age. And he looks at all things that he's worked hard for, and he says, wait a minute. Um, I've toiled under the sun, and I must leave everything that I've toiled for to someone else. And who knows whether that person will be wise or a fool. Uh, yet he will rule over all my labors, uh, which I toiled and which I have shown us uh, shown myself wise under the sun, and he says, my, that's vanity. <laughs> um, go ahead, Margaret. Yeah, the, the uh, New Living Translation says, how meaningless. How meaningless, yes. And so if the focus of our life is acquiring, 
What is it saying? That whatever you've acquired, there's someday you're going to have to let it go. And so if the focus of your life is inquiring, it's a wake-up call to say, hey, there's a dead end here. There's a disappointing moment. You can't take it with you, and you're going to be passing it on to someone else. And so you need, you need something more meaningful to be living for. And Solomon, who, and through the book Ecclesiastes, it's a beautiful picture of that lifestyle of acquiring for one. He said, I had enough money, and I have enough people around me to do whatever I wanted, and I did it. But guess what? When I had it, it didn't bring me the happiness. Happiness must come from something other than just possessions or a good time. How does the thought that God owns everything, that God owns everything, how does that thought impact your thinking about the things that you have in life? Anyone like to make a comment on that? Because sometimes so I worked hard for that. I mean, I had to work hard to, to get that degree. Now, I've often said you earn your degree just for following the instructions and getting the courses in, whether you got, you got an A, B, or C. Just to finish, you, deserve the, you serve, deserve the certificate. But the fact that God owns everything in this world, including yourself and what you own, how does that thought impact you, or does it? Who'd like to respond to that? Okay, it's a thought up here. It's not my original thought. It's what our lesson's all about. Uh, we're stewards. We're, we're given possessions or, or wealth or, or whatever was given to us, whatever talent. We're only a steward of it while we're on the earth. It all goes back to God, just like our breath. Yeah, and there's some Bible texts to, to respond to that. Uh, Psalm 24 and 1. What does Psalm 24 and 1, what does God declare? The earth is the, yeah, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. So not leaving anything out. Uh-oh. The world and those who dwell therein. So what does God claim? He doesn't leave anything out. And no matter who you are, what you've accomplished, what you own, he says, you're mine. You're mine. Yes, Margaret. You know, if we're in a job and the um, manager trusts us with certain responsibilities, we take a certain interest, probably a greater interest then, in carrying out these responsibilities knowing that the manager really trusts us. So here we are now. God owns everything, and yet he has given us management responsibilities. So what should be our response to the one who owns everything, who has given us the privilege of managing some of that for him? Yeah, that, that I brings... think that really shows us how much value he places on us and how much he wants us to be part of that forever. Yeah, I, I, th I think it's an awesome thing. I don't, I don't see myself as being cheated at all that God owns everything because he's the rightful owner and now he has given me privileges to be part of, you know, um, sharing Yes, that, yes. you know, as it says in the, the lesson, um, it's for our own needs, it's for the needs of others, and for the advancement of his work. Yes. So if we keep these three things as our priority, we have our own needs to look after, but we have to be mindful of the needs of others. And then in addition to that, there's a great work to be done for his glory. And he gives us the privilege to be part of advancing that work. I mean, I think, it, I think it's just marvelous that we have a God who cares that much for Amen. us. And that's beautiful. Well said. Uh, it gives you, doesn't it? It gives you a different attitude towards your work. It gives you a different attitude towards the people that are around you, the things you're involved with. It's not just a me focus. Then, like Margaret says, it's a God focus. And that's, 
And that's what, uh, uh, and some of you can quote 1 Corinthians 10, 31. I thought it was so, so fitting here. Whether you, what, eat or drink or whatever you do, do what? Do all to the glory of God. So that's a God-focused life. And so, wow, it's not just me. It's God-focused. And if it's God-focused, then it's his interest. And how do I respond to that? Beautiful. Um, I like very much, uh, when we look at management, and it's already been mentioned that his ownership of us involves our intellect, it involves our talents and abilities, it involves our education, it involves our careers, it involves our resources. It's a total package. Uh, it's all God's, and God, how can I be a good steward taking care of my needs, uh, family needs, uh, the uh, uh, needs in the community around me, as well as the advancement of your work. But I like very much uh, Exodus chapter 25, verses 2, and then going on to verse 8, and then chapter 35. So Exodus 25, 2. I like, some people think the Old Testament is, is so different than the New, but so much of the Old Testament actually is reflected in the New, or the New Testament reflects the Old. And in Exodus chapter 25, they're at, they're at the uh, um, Mount Sinai, and God wants to get closer to his people. And in getting closer to his people, he asks them to bring an offering to him. So in Exodus 25, 2, uh, what does it say about the offering that the people are asked to bring? So I'd like to read Exodus 25, 2. Speak unto the children of Israel that they may bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart that ye shall take my offering. Yeah, isn't that beautiful? I love that. If you bring an offering to the God, uh, how does he want you to bring it? Willingly. Whether it's a nickel or quarter or a million dollars, bring it willingly. Let it be a heart offering, uh, not obligation. And then right after that, in verse 8, he says, Now, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, and then whoever is of a willing heart. And in chapter 35, 21, uh, Bob had his hand up. He's willing to read. Uh, Exodus 35, 21, Bob. What does it say after Moses gave this instruction from the Lord and to build the tabernacle? And then you have from uh, 25 to 35 a description of all those parts of the, uh, of the tabernacle. And after the people heard this, how did they respond? In Exodus 35, 21, Bob. Everyone whose heart was moved and whose spirit was willing came and brought an offering. These gifts were used for the sanctuary and to make garments for Aaron and his sons, who were to serve as priests. Thank you. So what is the characteristic? It says, everyone whose spirit was willing, willing, brought the Lord's offering. It was between them and their Lord. And it was also, if you read it, it was between, uh, it, was, it was the capacity they brought according to their capacities for the building of the tabernacle. And we remember ultimately, uh, Moses had to stop the people and said, we have enough. Uh, you have been generous to this. All right, so God, that, that, that picture of God's ownership of the total us, all that we are, and that he desires us to be good stewards of that. Managers with the idea of stewardship. Managers with the idea that I'm not just looking after what he has, because when you take the story of the talents, the, the five, the two, and the one, they were to invest that for the, it would be assertive. I like that. They were not just, oh, I'm sitting here and I'm getting a paycheck and I'm looking over this business, right? No, you take the business and enlarge it for the Lord. All right, let's go to Tuesday's lesson. Tuesday's lessons. When I hit my iPhone, sometimes it goes radical. Tuesday's lessons on the resources available for God's family. Uh, 
So not only are we united in Jesus as part of his family, the created beings in heaven, it says, and on earth are brought into oneness by Jesus. Not only that, so it's not only oneness in the family, universal, all people, we all can call him our father in heaven, but he provides resources. He provides for us so that we're able to have a quality life and we're also able to fulfill a ministry. The first, uh, and someone, don't have to even look this one up. Uh, it says in Psalm 23, 1, the shepherd's psalm, what resource do we have in Psalm 23, 1? The, the Lord is my shepherd. So you have a picture of a shepherd and the sheep. And if the Lord is the shepherd, that means that he takes the responsibility of the shepherd. And so when you go to John chapter 10, 27, it says, My sheep hear my voice. I know them. And what do they do? They, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. And they follow me. Follow me. And so if you can see in your life that we are not out there in our own like a chip on the big ocean wondering what direction we need to go in life. We all know Psalm 119, 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a what? A light unto my path. And I always say, walking with Jesus is a leap in the light, not a leap in the dark, because he lightens our path. And one of the phrases I have here on Psalm 23 is this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall never want a different shepherd. Is that true? Is that good? He is my shepherd. So one of the resources we have, it's a beautiful resource, is people that don't accept Jesus don't have that. Now they have someone else that's trying to guide him, but he doesn't have a good track record. The Lord is my shepherd. He knows me. He hears our voice we follow him. I like that picture. In fact, I really encourage our church leadership in the church, my own in the office. We tend to make good plans to do the work. But we need to say, God, what are the plans that you have for me? What is the plans you have for St. John's Church, the Newfoundland mission? I don't want to go ahead of you. I'm supposed to follow you. So you need to reveal to me what your plans are. Um, so it needs to be more humbling before God, seeking his plans, than planning it uh, ahead of revealing his plans. Now, we have the general indication what he wants, but it's important to seek God what he wants. And then when you see where God is working and what he wants, be willing to go into it with all that you have. So the first resource that we have is Jesus himself. He's the shepherd over his people. John 16, 23, another. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, what will he do? He will guide you into all truth. So we not only have Jesus and all the resources he brings for, for us individually in our church, he has provided the Holy Spirit to guide us. He will lead and guide you into all truth. That shows an active interaction, right? And it's just like the one we read in, in uh, Romans 8.14. If you are led by the Spirit of God, you are the children of God. So the Holy Spirit leads you. And it says in the same chapter that his spirit speaks with our spirit. So are we familiar with God talking to us? Do we take the time to meditate, reflect, and allow him to talk to us. So we find here this beautiful thought that the Holy Spirit will guide us. Not only that, in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all what is given by inspiration of God? The scriptures. So Jesus himself, the Holy Spirit, scriptures are the written revelation of Jesus to guide us. Great. Our time is slipping by. Uh, I like Deuteronomy 6, 7, where it talks about the family. 
It says, you shall teach your children diligently. You should talk to them when you're walking by the way, when you're lying down, when you rise up. And so that which is a guide to us as family uh, is the family uh, itself. Our parents, our grandparents, uh, and probably once in a while our children can teach us as adults. So family is there to help us along the way. And of course the picture of uh, Matthew chapter 6 about worrying. It says, if you worry, what should, is two things you're supposed to consider. Consider the what? The lilies of the field, right? When you consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, yet Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of those. And what was the other picture that he had? Look at the, the besides the flowers, the birds, yes. He says, you don't see them carrying suitcases. Who takes care of them? And so it says, wow, why should you worry? It says, but it says, instead of worrying about tomorrow and today, seek ye what? First, first, the kingdom of God. Make that first in your life, and God will look after the rest. All right, Wednesday's lesson, responsibility of God's family members. Now, I'm going to say something that's controversial. Uh, it's my perspective, it's personal. But every time I hear it, I think, yes, there is a truth there, but it's not the Christian total truth. You hear in media often that says, a woman has the right to make the decision about her own body. Now, there's just some truth to that. Yes, there is some truth. But the Christian woman will say, a woman has a right to make a, make a choice about her body with the responsibility towards God, towards herself, towards her church, towards her community, and towards the baby. Is that true? We have a responsibility, and a woman, you can put a man in, in choices too. But it's more than just you have a right to choose. Because a Christian will say, I have a right to choose, but it's in light of how God thinks about it. It's in light of how it's going to impact my family. It's in light of how it impacts my church, how it impacts the community, as well as the baby. So the world may have that standard. The church must have a broader standard. If you want to talk to me later, you can. All right. We're down to our last few minutes. Uh, there are several verses in the Bible that talks about our standard uh, with God. One is, you should love the Lord how? How much? With all. With all your heart. Um, with all your soul or your life, and with all your strength. So you have some very, very strong words there. You have the word all. How much is all? Can you add to that? Or does it encompass everything? All encompasses, encompasses everything. So all your emotional side of your life, all the mental side of your life, all of the energy of your life, I don't think you can add much to that. Isn't that something? God is willing to accept all of that. I think that's beautiful. Now Micah 6.8 has been a text that has lifted a standard uh, he has shown me, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love, mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Now, there's one other one that I, I put in here. And that's James 1.27. I like that, too. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself what? Unspotted from the world. That's another one. Uh, we could go into Matthew 25. It says when Jesus comes, he's going to separate from the, the goats and the sheep, and he'll say to those on his right hand, to enter into his kingdom, why? What was the basis of their lifestyle that made them eligible for being part of his kingdom? 
as much as you've done it unto the least brethren. And what types of things truly did they do? They visited the sick, they provided for the hungry, clothed the naked, and visited those in prison. Yeah. All right. Our final lesson is treasure in heaven. So Matthew 6, 19 to 21, says, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth. Well, you have to have a little bit, but don't make that the focus of your life. Uh, you get your first 50,000, guess what? You want another 50. You get another 50, you want another 50. If money is the focus of your life, you'll never be satisfied. I remember checking an article, oh, this looks good. It talks about retirement. And the first paragraph says, well, first thing you need to do is save $2 million getting ready for retirement. <coughs> and I said, well, that's enough of that article. Let's go on. <laughs> um, but it's, why does it say there that we should not lay up for ourselves treasures on earth? Why? It says two things will happen if you do. Where what and what will happen to your goods? Moth and rust. Have you ever heard people that uh, save old cars? Now, there are some people that know how to do that real well. But if you let a car sit for 10 years, what's going to happen to that car, do you think? You may have to do your brakes over. They've seized, and maybe, yeah, you'll find must and rust have gotten to something, even if it's protected. But instead of focusing on laying up tre treasures there, it says lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Why would you lay yourself up for yourselves treasures in heaven? Why? What's the benefit of that? It's going to last. So it's going to last, and the verse says two other things. Because what's not going to happen to the treasures in heaven? It's not going to be a moth or a rust that's going to destroy them, right? And they're going to last. Good to answer. Uh, so how do we lay up for, our, for ourselves treasures in heaven? It seems to say something we can do. Have anyone come across the bank of heaven where you can go down and make a deposit? No, but we lay it up by investing investing in others and investing in the Lord's work. And so it is, it is putting God uh, as central in our lives. And that way you invest in people. When you help people in need, you're investing for God. When you're lifting the burdens around you, you're investing for God. When you make a contribution to help a young person go to youth camp, you're investing for God. So investing for his work. How can I know where my treasures are? So if someone, just, if someone said, well, I'm a, I love to invest for God, or I, I haven't heard about it, I'm investing, how, how can I can tell whether I'm investing in God? What will I look at in my life? to indicate how I am investing for God. I listed four things, and you probably can think of them very quickly. Name one thing about my life that would tell you whether or not I'm investing for God. Alice, it looks like it's on the tip of your tongue. What would you say one thing is? It would be closeness to God. Closeness to God. All right, that'd be use of your Time, maybe? Time, talents, Oh, yeah, money. You're, getting, you're getting them all. Name them all. <laughs> you can't just name one. No, okay, go on, <laughs> name all you can think so of. So time, it. talents, um, your, your respect for God's law, your, your love for him, and if you love, like Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Yeah. And so that's, that's the real, to me, that's the crux of the whole thing. Yes. If we love God, keep his commandments. And it will show. Others will see, it will reflect. His character will reflect off of you. Yes, yes. <clears throat> uh, how I use my time, uh, what do I talk about, how I invest my money, and friends that I keep. Anyone remember the, uh, the film called Fireproof? Okay, what did he do that showed that he did not have his heart 
in, in his love for his wife? What was he saving? How was he using his, using his money? He was saving for a what? He was saving for a boat rather than helping his wife provide the uh, necessary equipment that his mother, her mother need af needed after her uh, stroke. And it was more important for him to save money for his boat. And that was the conflict. He showed where his heart was. But the story goes on. He eventually humbled and came around to God. And then his wife's parents' need became important to him. Yeah, we have illustrations today a lot. Just one practical illustration. Some of you probably have... Um, you have been accumulating aeroplan points, right? It's not that many years ago that for 25,000 points, you could fly any place in North America. But over the time of COVID, guess what? It is now 35,000 points plus an additional cost depending on how far it is you're flying. So if you've saved aeroplan points to when you get old and, and then you can take a trip around the world, got news for you, time changes and so does every every guideline connected with these benefits. It's beautiful to think that we are stewards, managers of God, and I think we think of the parables in closing, the parable of the talents. Whether you have five talents or two talents, we want to hear from the Lord because we've used them to multiply and to advance his cause. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little things. I will make you faith. I'll have you in charge of many things. Loving Father, what a privilege it is to know that we're part of the family of God, and every brother and sister here is part of my family. If we accept Jesus, we are part of the family. We're also part of the human family by creation. What a privilege to know that. And what a privilege it is to know that whether we eat or drink, whatever we do, we want to give you glory. We thank you for that philosophy of life, and may we truly bring you glory, is our desire in Jesus' name. Amen.